I'm supposed to say something. I'm supposed to say like welcome back to Ty and some other guy. In this case, the other guy being Brett. So welcome Stay back again. to Ty and some other guy. And the other guy is Brett. Director Brett. Hey. Who is busily directing just before we got started here. So he's uh he's a working man. He's a working director. But uh, working in the salt mines of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> that's really glamorizing it yeah 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 you no, got your la hat on yeah yeah you know we're just representing you know well, west coast i appreciate you taking time out from your busy schedule of keeping hollywood in business to come here and talk about the least hollywood movie i have seen in 10 years yes very the much the least I'm hollywood s- thing maybe of the last 20 years yes yeah yes yes I'm so excited to talk about this movie. So we are going to talk about possibly the greatest Nicolas Cage performance of all time. Um, yep. We are here to talk about Batman's father's dick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and his amazing songwriting skills. We are here to talk about the four quad runners of the apocalypse. <laughs> We're here to talk about that. Bill Duke apparently is the keeper of holy crossbows. Love so it. what movie are we talking about that contains all these elements? We're talking about leaving Las Vegas. No, Obviously. Mandy. <laughs> Mandy 2018. Craziest horror movie ever. Is it a horror movie? But no, that's, I mean, <laughs> great question. I mean, I feel like it is, but I was, it is funny when you go into it, it's surprising how unhorror it is for so long. Yeah. Which is why it's, I think, why the sec. I, I can't, I feel like we talked about this before, but maybe we didn't. But I just swear by this theory that so many horror movies operate in a two act structure, um, not a three act structure. And this movie is, it falls right into the same category where you have half of a movie that's really setting up the second half of the movie very successfully like it's yeah. done so well but the whole first half is not scary but there is this palpable sense of doom in it i would say really that the first half is eerie yes 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 and w- not scary but eerie yes yeah. and i think the eeriness is part of what creates that sense of doom you're talking about yeah like you're very uncomfortable and you don't fully know why and then you start right. to see all the chess chess pieces start to get assembled on the board as a story is playing out and you're just kind of going, wow, is this all going to converge into something? It's so good. It's so good. Um, so are you, are you, were you, I don't know how old you are. Were you around, were you a kid in the eighties? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. I was. So, so you, you know about eighties heavy metal album covers, right? Yes, totally. Like, you know, wizard of Oz, the, the, the great Aussie cover, um, you know, like yeah. all that stuff. Okay. So if, uh, anything that had Ronnie James Dio in it had amazing covers. Um, yep. And, and of course, Iron Maiden always had, you know, add all the Eddie always. covers. So, I was so say Mandy to me is 80s heavy metal album cover, the movie. Yeah, <laughs> literally. If you pause it at any point, you have an album cover. You have an album 80s cover. metal, yeah, exactly. Yes, from, from about the halfway point on, any place you pause it, you've got a heavy metal album cover. Yes, and so many of the elements in the movie, and we'll get to this stuff, but like the weapon that he makes for himself mm-hmm. is absolutely straight off the cover of a Dio album. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 100%. And it's funny because if you saw that weapon out of the context of the movie, you'd be like, well, this is ridiculous. Yeah. What, but, what the hell is this? Yeah. yeah, yeah like, this is all oh, right. But watching it, the movie, you don't even bat an eye. You're just like, yeah, that looks like the type of thing he should make. To go, well, and do that's the thing do. you need to kill the four uh, quad riders of the apocalypse. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so Mandy, let's let's get let's get down to nuts and bolts. If you have not seen Mandy, maybe you should pause this, go watch Mandy, and then come back because we're going to spoil the shit out of Mandy, and um, it's going to be confusing to listen. <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> a confusing. lot of it won't make sense. Well, so this is a movie that only makes sense inside of the movie. This is a yeah. movie, you know. It's this is the Matrix line, you know. The translation software works for the Matrix, so you got to be inside right. the Matrix to understand the Matrix, right? So good. Um, you got to be inside of Mandy to understand Mandy, and the people who watch it expecting, like, 
a narrative and and a standard movie are just confused by it. The people who watch it and then in the first 10 minutes or so realize that it is this weird fever dream of stuff that's happening and just sort of go with the flow, those people come out of it loving this movie. Yes, like, for sure. I've shown it to a bunch of my friends and the ones who were just sort of like, I don't want to say they were high watching it, but I'm sure it helped. Um, yeah, but the people I who just sort that. of go with the flow, they're, they love this movie. The people yeah. are like, why did he do that? And why is that happening? And I don't understand the plot. Those people do not love this. If you're willing to accept it for what it is, you're in for a great ride. But if you're going to try and fight it and figure it out the whole time, you know, it might not be the right movie for you. It's not the right movie. So loosely, the, the story is a story of a man who apparently cuts down trees in the Northwest. Look, look like my neighborhood where he was cutting those trees down. Uh, man who cuts down trees in the Northwest and then goes home to his wife slash girlfriend. I'm not sure. Mandy love of his life, love of his life. And the two of them seem to have a great relationship. They seem to really get along. They're both weirdos and they have that sort of like, it's lucky we found each other because we're the only two people who could possibly be in this relationship because we're both just fucking weirdos. And then she draws the, his, his, wife the titular mandy draws the attention of a group of people who are clearly some sort of weird sex cult living in the woods and draws the attention of the leader of that cult who decides he's going to kidnap her force her to join his sex cult and become his one of his brides she rejects that in one of the best scenes of the entire movie she rejects that proposition and the cult murders her in a horrible, horrible way. Oh, horrifically murders her, yeah. Horrifically murders her. The Nicolas Cage character goes on the hell-bent path of retribution to hunt down the people who murdered Mandy, take his revenge upon them. Yep. And in the simplest terms, what the, what the movie is. But the simple terms do not describe this movie. <laughs> no. No. <They're, laughs> that You hear that and you go, well, this is cool. But if someone yeah. told you that much and you went in to go see it, you would be... You would not be set up for success. No. Because the, the thing about it is, okay, so take Ty's description of the movie. And then what you start to layer into it is there's a storybook quality to it. Like it feels a little bit like a fairy tale. Yes. I love that it's told in chapters. I don't know why that's like a gimmick that just gets me every time. Like anytime, I never have an instinct to do it in my own work. And I don't know why. Because every time I see someone do it, I'm like, oh, I love this. Chapters? Yes. But right. then the style of it's also very elevated and feels kind of dreamlike, which is important because the movie yep. takes on a lot of fantasy elements, kind of cosmic horror, fantasy horror elements within this story, right? It like it does, it's, yeah, which is cool. Yeah, and, and and without ever fully going cosmic horror, it right. feels like a story that takes place in a universe in which cosmic horror exists. And it just yes. never actually, Cthulhu doesn't show up. You know, right. uh, you know the, the hounds of Tyndalus don't come bursting out of the walls. But it feels like if they did, this is the story that would happen. Yes. Right? Yes, exactly. I love like you, you have a feeling like if this story was taking place at the coast, there would definitely be Cthulhu worshippers. Yeah, 100%. And it actually does something that I love when low budget, I shouldn't say low budget, like lower budget, like, I would, say, I would describe it as movie. an indie. It's definitely yeah, indie. It's, it's indie. an indie for sure. But I love when a smaller story still makes suggestions of much bigger ideas, right? Like this feels like a small story that is just on the peripheral of a much bigger thing that could happen, which is really cool because it just kind of gets your brain going. Like, you're like, oh, man, what is this? Like the whole intrigue of what the cult worships, how they worship. And then, of course, then I mean, we're going to have to talk about the bikers because the bikers are really, the bikers. truly the only semi sort of supernatural element that really manifests in the movie. But right, they also aren't like you don't see them like materialize out of thin air, but you also can tell they're not human. And so it's like, what well, let's talk things? about that. Let's let's dip. Since we've we've described sort of the, the general big picture plot. 
So let's talk about these elements that we keep sort of hinting about. The leader of this cult, who is played by, uh, you know the actor's name, and it flew out of my head. It's the guy who plays Linus Batman's. Roach. Linus Roach. Uh, by He's the way, so good. an actor that I love. Because yes. that is a guy who can play anything. He plays Bruce Wayne's father in the Nolan Batman films, and he's great. He's, he's, he's loving, and he seems very warm and very intelligent. Seems like a total dad that you would want, right? But he can play the creepiest dudes ever. He's got enormous yes. range, this guy. He's, he goes from, in Batman Begins, incredibly, like he said, like warm and endearing. And then in this, he's completely repulsive. He's and repulsive. It actually, it actually really, I, I really kind of wrestled with this movie for a minute because Batman Begins is just one of my all-time favorites. And I love yeah. I, him. His Thomas Wayne is not in the movie very much at all, but the right. impact of his of his screen time is huge. And then he shows up in this and I'm like, Oh, Tom, he's here. Daddy yeah, Wayne. Yeah, and then yeah, very really. quickly. Yeah. You're like, stop <laughs> acting like that. Please stop acting like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's not what Thomas Wayne would do. Yeah. He wouldn't do yeah. that. Where's Bruce? But it was so, he's incredible in this. I actually was listening to a few of the, I was going back listening to some of the Sundance interviews that cage and um, the director Cosmatos did together. And I guess Nicholas cage was, got involved because they wanted to cast him as the cult leader like that was oh, the really whole in yeah so the whole in was oh, that, that they that, were going that's... to interesting oh, right like yeah. you can totally see how like that thought works how it makes sense yeah, when they found yeah. out that nick cage was willing to meet the cult leader he was saying was written in nicholas cage's voice uh... um and when nicholas cage read the script he was like i'm actually really interested in red the lead yeah yeah and they were like wait what and the director panos was like like expressing how he just had a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to that he's like i don't think that's right but then he kind of marinated on a little bit he's like actually that's incredible and right and and it's what's funny is he said he never rewrote the cult leaders um dialogue away from nicholas cage he just left it like that and that's what linus roach had to deal with it was well, in a phenomenal I think, way I, I think what linus roach brings to that because it is sort of written in that sort of manic Nicolas Cage version, but he yes. never plays it manic. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, there's, there's this eerie disconnect to the words yes. that he's saying and the way that he's delivering them, which I think really works for the movie. It's perfect. So it's one of those accidental genius ideas, right? Absolutely is. Yeah. yeah it, he said Linus did an interview where he was talking about how he viewed his character as like a, like a like an overprivileged five year old that basically yeah. is just constantly stomping his feet and throwing tantrums and yeah because everybody things. does what he wants them to do yeah yeah and I was like oh because that scene after he gets rejected by Red's wife Mandy <laughs> she doesn't like his song which is shocking because such a great song when he has that scene in front of the mirror where he's like tell me what to do tell me what to do tell me what to do tell me and he just keeps saying it over and over again I was like he's just repeating the same line, but the scene feels like so much is happening in it. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It was so impressive to me. He's just, okay. he's so great in the movie. So, so let's talk, let's talk about those, those weird elements. So, so the, the, the big picture story is a revenge story. Guys kidnap Cage's wife. They murder Cage's wife. Cage goes on a revenge kick. Okay. But in the course of that, we have the attempted Linus Roach, Seduction, which is my favorite scene in the movie, which we are going to talk about. We have a magic horn that summons the four horsemen of the apocalypse, except that they're bikers who don't ride Harleys. They ride quad runners. Yeah. And four wheelers, and four wheelers. And, and, and they wear weird mix of like spiked armor and biker gear, but are clearly like the enforcers for the Linus Roach cult leader. But they never yes. explain why he has this magic horn that summons them. Or are they demons? None of it are is they explained. Guys? None of that's explained. Nope. You've got Nicolas Cage, when he decides to go after them, realizes he's going to need some firepower, goes to visit his friend Bill Duke, who apparently yeah. has been keeping his magic crossbow for him. Yeah, I mean, after, after the whole situation <laughs> with Predator, that's what Bill Duke just lived, did with his life. Is he just yeah. moved into this trailer to hold on he to crossbows He moved into a trailer in the Northwest. Yeah. And said, You're Cage, I, I'll you go ahead and keep your magic crossbow here. I'll keep it in my, my trailer. Yeah. Uh, so cool crossbow, to see by the way, and A crossbow, it's named the Reaper. Yeah. 
<laughs> which i mean you got to name your crossbow something right it's just so heavy metal like that would it's be the so track on metal. an album right like, it's so just heavy. like <laughs> i need the reaper it's and so then, good and then at some point cage forges another weapon for himself because apparently he has forgery skills he, he put points into forgery or forging yep. not forgery forging, forging. and Thank maybe you. forgery you know it's like we don't know we don't know he <laughs> never, but he never gets to use that skill in this right 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 so he forges the most heavy metal album cover battle act ever ever it looks like yeah. it looks like a xenomorph spine made out of metal <laughs> welded to an axe blade that is a really great way of putting that. This is like the axe that like a xenomorph would be yeah. running around with. Yeah, that it made out of the spinal cord of another xenomorph that it killed in battle. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's such a great description. And 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 this very straightforward story plays out with Nicolas Cage confronting the obstacles that stand between him and revenge. Yeah. You know, battling the cult getting seriously injured in the process, getting like yeah. stabbed and all that stuff, having to, having to somehow, somehow vodka cures all of his injuries, which, you know, I mean, I mean, I think he's not the only person to think that. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's a, it's a common, a common thing. Right. vodka cures all of his many injuries, including a stab wound. Right. Um, right. Gathers his weapons, goes after the Linus Roach character, has to battle his way past the four, Quadman of the apocalypse battle his way past the cult and eventually have the confrontation It's sort yep. of the, the series of events. But right. It's like a video game. He's just it's building like up to the final game. boss. Yeah. But the, the thing that the description fails to do is get across the, the weirdness of each of those moments. Yeah. The weirdness of everything that happens. Yes. The, the every, everything that happens in this movie is so strange when, the first time Nicolas Cage confronts the cult and loses, gets stabbed and, and almost dies and, and goes back to his house. So he's, he's, he's back at his house. He's been stabbed. He's, he's injured, failed in his quest to get, get revenge. So there's the scene that it, it, a very standard scene in an action movie is the hero has to doctor himself, right? You know, you go, it goes all the way back to the first Rambo when he has to sew up his wound, right? With the thread in his like combat knife, right? It's like yep. a very common scene. Survival is up is, to you and you alone. Yeah. Right. This scene is Nicolas Cage bandages himself using nothing but vodka. Pours vodka in his mouth, pours vodka on his injuries. This apparently heals him. Yeah. From I mean, this. And I while he's really doing should have it, looked up the brand of the vodka because maybe it's good to it's have good around. Stuff. That vodka is good stuff. But while he's doing it, he's lying on the bathroom floor in his weird little bathroom wearing a shirt with like a cartoon tiger on it. Mm-hmm. And tidy whitey yep. underwear. And underwear, yep. It's <laughs> tidy whiteys. It's the weirdest fucking scene. And it's he's like so weird. Crying and man- and manically laughing and pouring vodka on himself. And it's so strange. <laughs> it's so strange. But the other thing that's so wild about it is that it we skipped over the scene that leads into it when he watches the Cheddar Goblin commercial. Right. Right. Which is also so weird. But what's so funny is when I first saw this movie, that commercial, I was just like, what? This movie feels like it's being weird to be weird at this point. Like, what on earth is going on? But then I listened to the director talk about it. So it made rewatching it before we talked about it today. I I rewatched it last week. And the context of it's so different. His whole point was he was talking about how this whole movie was his kind of cathartic way of channeling his own grief that he was wrestling with. And so uh, he's like, this was my own pathos as far as just wrestling with grief and what do you do about grief? And I was like, oh, that's an interesting insight into the story. I can see that. Yeah. And he was talking about how going through something, the world doesn't care what you're going through. Right. And how that commercial was basically meant to articulate, I'm, I just had this horrible loss. I'm going through the worst moment imaginable. Yeah. And this is the commercial that pops up on my TV. Yeah. Like, yeah, who care. It, no, that's that's it, an interesting, interesting insight. So that feeling of like the worst thing that can happen to you. And the movie does a great job of establishing the relationship between the two of these guys in it. In not a lot of screen time, but you get the sense that these two are th- perfect for each other and the only two people who could be in this relationship. You know, that 100 percent that it is. It is. It, they're incredibly close. 
that it's only the two of them in their lives. Their lives are just about the two of them. And so when she dies, the the devastation that he feels, you feel it. Like it, they yeah, do a great job sure. of making you feel how devastated he is by what just happened. Yes. And there 100%. is this there is this feeling that when something like that happens to you, the world is supposed to stop. It's yeah, supposed it's to supposed give you to. a minute. But yeah. your point about the world doesn't care. The world's still doing exactly. what it's doing. Like, They're still showing stupid commercials on TV. Like you're the going most through the worst pain of your life. Timed commercial. Like the tone yeah. is the complete worst yeah. tone of the moment. Yes. But that's the point. But that's the point. That's exactly yeah. the point. Yeah, and, and you also get the sense, I mean, the movie does a great job of implying a lot of story without stating it outright. And one of the things that they imply is that he had trouble with drugs or alcohol. That he's that he's sober. Um, he's sobered from his like something in his past. From something in his past. And so that moment where he just starts drinking the vodka in the bathroom. Yeah. Is is that it is that next step of spiraling downward. It is right. Fuck it. You know, like, like it's it, the implication is he got clean for her. Yep. And yeah. so now that she's gone, fuck it. It's like, I'm just going to pound this for? vodka. And, and he's pounding that shit, man. He drinks like the whole fucking bottle. He is, he goes full Nicholas cage. He goes, like, full, just this is Nicolas leaving cage. Las Vegas level. Nicholas cage. Yeah. He's just <laughs> pounding that bottle of vodka. <laughs> but I think what's interesting too, to point out, in context with this was that this was this movie also felt a little bit like Nicolas Cage coming back to back to form because yeah. he hadn't done a movie with he hadn't done a movie prior to this for a few years that felt like we got to see Nicolas Cage do what he does best. Yeah. And so that was the other yep. exciting thing about this movie when it came out. It was like not only is this movie visually cool and story cool and it, it, it's Nick Cage is back. Like it's him at his most and it's not self-parodying Nick Cage. No, there was a number of movies all. before this where it felt like Nick Cage making fun of Nick Cage. Yeah. This I agree doesn't with feel that. like he's making fun of himself. This feels like no. he's just in the moment playing the scene with using all of his Nicolas Cage powers. Yes. And it's and it's meant to be taken seriously. This is not a joke. One hundred percent. Yeah. And that's I feel like revenge stories really and this movie does it so well. Not all of them do, but this one did so well where a revenge story requires a character to have to reach a point that they're willing to die. Like their grief is like, I always think of lethal weapon cause I love lethal weapon, but you know, it's like Riggs, his life was never the same after his loss to the point where he's like, I, I truly don't care what happens to me. And obviously it's handled very differently, but Mandy, the scene of him just like we're talking about the bathroom chugging the out. You're basically seeing him dive right back off the cliff. Like just, yeah, he's yeah. going head first into the abyss. Yeah. And now when he's going to get his crossbow, he's fashioning his crazy heavy metals, you know, more facts, you know, all the stuff you're like, but yeah, like I, I get it. What I else it. would you do? What else yeah. would you do? Yep. It's so, cause the thing that got me the most, and it actually was the biggest emotional reaction I had watching the movie was the fact that their relationship is set up so well, it would have been enough for him to find out that she died, but he watched her get burned alive. Yes. They, they make him watch. He, he has to watch it. He's chained up. Yep. They're going to leave him for dead. Yep. He realizes these guys are just could care less about me while they do whatever they want to the love of my life. I can't do anything about it. And then they make him watch her die. I'm like, that would be enough to turn me into an absolute psychopath. Oh yeah. Like for I sure. would just like, yeah, you would definitely so be looking so for earned. your magic crossbow. Yeah. I would, <laughs> I would go get the Reaper first thing from Bill yeah. Duke. Yeah. But it, it's what I appreciated was like, man, for how extreme as this movie gets, it's crazy how well the movie earned it. You know what I yeah. mean? Like it, yeah. it really earned the right to go as nuts as it gets. Yeah. Which is pretty yeah. ballsy. And I really it, love that. It also, in these scenes, you know, the scene where uh, the murder happens, watch the scene where he's getting ready for his revenge. You know, he's drinking the vodka. He's getting ready to go to Bill Duke. It, this is also a bunch of scenes where we really start to slip into this sort of nightmare sort of, and, and uh, later I'd love you to talk about the visuals, how they do that, uh, as uh, bring your director voice to it, because I, I'm curious, there's something going on with the visuals here where mm -hmm. it feels like there's a slider for normal world to weird world that as yeah. the movie goes, the director is just slowly pushing the slider 
here very slowly, yep. right? Yeah. Not never so far that you detect it happening, but there's yep. a moment it's, you're about half or two thirds into the movie. You go, everything looks so fucking weird now. Yeah. And I didn't it's, see how it did happening. We get here. Yeah, exactly. How did we get everything so weird? Right. And, and things like, and, and, you know, you talked about this, which I think is great, which is that this movie feels like it is a more normal story that's happening in a word world where a lot of not normal stuff is happening. Yes. Like we're absolutely. in, we're in a cosmic horror universe. This just is the not super cosmic horror story that's happening in that universe. We're following the two only people that exist in it. Normal people. The two normal <laughs> like people. This, yeah. The, the guy yeah. who he's like a lumberjack and she works in a store. Right? Yeah. Like we just and everybody want to be else here and be in love. Fucking weirdos. But yes, but the things and the, the implications without statements, like when he goes mm-hmm. to Bill Duke, so now he's decided to get his revenge. He's been stabbed. His wife slash girlfriend has been murdered in front of his eyes by this horrible cult. He's ready for some fucking revenge. He's drunk. He drank an entire bottle of vodka. Yep. He's ready to throw it out. He goes to Bill Duke's little trailer out in the woods and he gets the Reaper. There's nothing in the movie that gives you the context of why he knows Bill Duke, why Bill Duke nope. knows him. What past they shared. There's implied past, but they never talk about it. Right. Bill Duke acts like he, like Nicholas Cage, he's holding something that Nicholas Cage didn't trust himself to have. Like it's yeah. a big deal to give it back to him. Yes. Right? As if, as if Nicholas Cage has this violent past, but they never say that. No, it's all implied. It's all implied. So he gives him the, so well. the crossbow back. And Bill Duke is sort of acting like, if I'm giving this back to you, then that means you're going off to die. That means you're going on a mission yeah. that will kill you, right? That's I how he's acting. Means. That's how he's playing the scenes, right? Totally. So, like, the whole time I'm fascinated, like, what is their past? What, what, what supernatural otherworldly horror did Bill Duke and Nicolas Cage have to fight in the past using the Reaper? <laughs> <laughs> or is Nicolas Cage just out living in the woods chopping lumber because he used that crossbow in a very normal world to commit real murder? <laughs> you know, like, right? Just because the movie would and... allow both to be true. <laughs> exactly right. I know. Yeah. It's, but it's actually, what you're touching on is another thing that I really appreciated about Mandy. For all the things that it suggests, not even just his backstory, but even just the cult's worship and the supernatural nature of things surrounding what they do, right? Or like the four bikers. I loved how much the movie wasn't concerned about explaining things because it was so refreshing because I just feel like we just live in a day and age where movies are risky to make and they're big investments and there's so many cooks in the kitchen that it's a very daring thing to say, we've implied it enough. We don't need to keep talking about it. We don't need to spell it out because it's like, I, I mean, I know we've, touched on this before Wes and I always talk about twilight zone like crazy. I'm just forever, just obsessed with the twilight zone. And it's some of the like best master television ever, ever still, yeah. still yeah. is. And yeah. like, and it's wild how much that show is just a masterclass of suggestion. Like yep. how many things we know about that show that the show actually never spelled out. It yeah. only gave us the clues. Right. Yeah. Yep. And every time I watch episodes of twilight zone, I'm like, man, this is just, it's brilliant. It's perfect. And this movie does a lot of that. It's laying out the breadcrumbs of what could be the answer. Yeah. But that's up to you. And I, I mean, love I, that. I think, I think this movie takes place in, in the same cinematic universe as the Twilight Zone. Yeah, definitely <laughs> could. I mean, if they had Rod Serling come out in the beginning, you know, this is the story of a lumberjack. <laughs> You'd be yeah. like, great. You'd be like, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, yeah, Rod, I'm down. Let's watch it. <laughs> I'm with it. <laughs> as Even with the chapter smoking. style. Every instead of the chapter breaks, you know, they yeah. just have him step out and like so they went for a drive. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it so, could work. So, so this is the beginning of the revenge story. So he gets his cross, he gets goes to a hangout with Bill Duke, gets his crossbow, forges the Xeno axe, and then goes out to do battle. Um and and at some point in here, Linus Roach had his guy go get the magic horn that summons the four quad men of the apocalypse. The goo guys on the quads. Yeah. yeah. And so now, now we get the Nicholas Cage has to defeat them to get to Linus Roach. You know, it's the video game thing, right? You got to defeat yeah. this guy so he can fight the boss and, and nothing goes to plan. You know, you're like, Oh, he's going right. to use the crossbow to kill all the guys. No, it doesn't work. He shoots one guy with the crossbow still has yep. to fight him. 
then we get that it's not enough yeah it's not enough then we get the super creepy scene at the house yeah it's like this weird broken down old building that the quad men are living in yeah it's like watching porn derelict house yeah that's a choice but then you see the dead couple like suggesting that they just straight up took this house from some old people from some old people and now they hang out there watching porn we're deducing this from just the clues they gave us, right? Like they never said that, but the the visuals tell it pretty clearly. You're like, oh my gosh! Well, the the, the quad men do occasionally creepy. have lines, but you can't understand them. Right? Yeah, they exactly. They say stuff, but it's not comprehensible. It's like unintelligible. Like, yeah, creature talk. It's like creature talk. So then, so then we get the the battle in the old house, and. Yep. Everything is so weird. Everything is so unsettling. The the dead old couple and the guy watching porn in the next room. Like just yeah. something about that combination of things is so unsettling. It just feels gross. It like feels it feels gross. really gross. Yeah. Every time the the four guys are on screen, they feel gross. Like yeah. just there's just something animal and filthy about them. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Which we is part so of we the get, horror of it. It's that, like part they, of the horror of it is like just the most how, straight ahead forward piece of the movie is yes. those guys yeah. completely. Yeah, yeah, you could see them in a horror. Movie. Yeah, 100%. and if you're if you're ever out camping in the woods and one of those guys shows up, you're in a horror movie now. Yep. Welcome <laughs> to it. Reaper with you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's touching on those touching on the four quad goo guys? I was I was listening to um the director talk about how he had a nightmare with them in it, which is how that kind of became an idea for the movie. But the reason why I think that's so interesting is because I remember the first time I saw it, I felt like they were visually treated so much the way a nightmare is where they had all these weird shapes and things about their silhouettes, but they were never shown in full definition. You know, like there's, there's this weird veil between you and the ability to see what they actually look like, which it just psychologically feels the same as having a nightmare. And I'm like, I I can't believe the movie is doing this. Like that's incredible is that they're very often backlit. Yeah. Yeah. So they are a silhouette. Always silhouette. Exactly. Like obscured. And it, it it was so, it just added to how creepy it was, but I thought that was so cool to know that like this, this idea came from a nightmare, but you also perfectly executed what it feels like to have a nightmare with them in it the way that yeah. you made this movie, which it's not easy to do. It's, it's stylistically kind of incredible. Well, let, let's, this is a good moment to talk about that then before we get to the end of this. So, so as a director, what techniques are you seeing Cosmodus use that, that are slowly turning the weird dial up? What is he doing there yeah. visually that is, that is constantly slowly turning that dial? The first thought I have whenever I think about the stylistic choices of this movie is just like bravo. Cause it's like, you don't see in the same way, like we're talking like movies, people want movies to be as safe as possible to invest in them. You know, the fact that this movie made such bold stylistic choices, I just am always in such high levels of respect for anything that swings so hard for the fences, whether it succeeds or fails. It's like good for you for trying. Cause in this, and all the noise of the endless content that's out there, how do you be seen? And we're, we're still talking about Mandy now because it yeah. just demanded that it needed to be noticed, right? And yeah. like stylistically, I feel like right out the gate, it starts with that. But one of the things I noticed that they kind of do throughout the movie is um, the film grain starts to get more intense. Oh, it's is that, that right? Yeah. It, it, okay. It's, and I don't think it's necessarily that they were turning up the dial literally like we're thinking but it's because the nighttime stuff naturally feels grainier just because right. of the nature of filming in lower light right right and because so much of the back half of the movie takes place in the dark it just kind of naturally causes the graininess of the movie to be even more subconsciously kind of thicker and chunkier and in there but it is there from the start but it does feel like it's cranked up it also feels like the colors get cranked up more I mean, the movie's super saturated from the beginning, which I also yeah. really love. I'm like coming from like the early aughts when we had all the Platinum Dune movies that were all like bleach bypass, you know, just kind of like yeah. low color, like seeing something that was just like hyper neon was like right. the coolest thing ever. But it did feel like 
the colors started getting kicked up more. But you'll you probably noticed, but towards the end of the movie too, there's also it's almost becoming monotone, but with like red or like a color yeah. where it's like it, the the color palette is kind of narrowing more and more and more as the movie progresses. Where it almost feels like a large chunk of the last half of the movie is just black and red. Yes. So it all just kind of feels like that. It's almost like the stylistic choices that were made subtly in the first half start to become way more dynamic and specific and focused in the back half. That's kind of what I think. But another thing that we got to talk about that I think contributes to it is um, the score. Because the score to that is just incredible. Like the whole 80s vibe and the synth is kind of dreamlike from the start. Yeah, but then it starts getting more intense and kind of more heavy metal, like towards the end, and just kind of driving, and you're like, Ugh, like your heart's racing more, even just listening to the movie. Yeah, it was really yeah. good. Well, since we're talking about stylistic things that they did for the cult, let's talk about the cult a little bit. So we we get the we know that that Nicholas Cage is launched on his revenge journey. We know he's defeated the first level of bad guys, which are the four quad guys. Mm-hmm. Um. But on the cult side, we haven't talked a ton about them, and I do want to talk about them because this is going backwards in time in the movie a little bit. But you know, when they pick Mandy up, they kidnap her and they take her in, and we get this group of very eclectic group: some guys, some women. Uh, the that one woman who's like in every movie now; she's on like every M Night Shyamalan movie. The the one who plays uh, the older woman. Oh um, yeah yeah yeah. Uh, it, I can't so we remember. get we I, get young women, we get older women, or at least yep. one older woman. We get these different guys. They don't seem like they belong together in a group, which I think is a good choice for a cult. That yeah, that that it's a weird mix of people get drawn Same. into this thing. It's kind of these misfits from their own circles that yeah, have made their yeah, own circle together. Yeah, it's the group of misfits. Yes, exactly. Um, led by and and we we get the sense that one of the things that they're doing is they're using strange drugs. They yes. drug Mandy at some point. But the drugs in a real crazy use, way, <laughs> because they are in the cosmic horror universe. The drugs they use come from a giant bug. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> "What?" When they first pull, it's like it's they basically have this giant hornet. Yeah, is what it looks like, right? It looks it's like, like a, a giant gi- hornet. Yeah, or that wasp, I guess is a giant living wasp, in a, maybe. Yeah, like a wasp that I guess is living in a jar of juice, but yeah. it's not dead. Right. Which I was like, "How does this work?" But when that whole scene was happening, I was like, what are they going to, are they going to like wrath of con this thing and like make this thing go in her ear (laughs) or like what is happening? But then it just stings her and sends her on a trip. Right. So, so in this sort of the weird cosmic horror universe that they're in, you get your drugs from giant bugs that you keep in jars of juice. Um, (laughs) which we all have. I mean, that's just, that's just how it works. Again, nobody explains it. It's never explained. It's just, that's how this works. And then you get my favorite scene in the movie where she yep. is brought out. She's drugged. She's brought out. The cult is all there looking at her and Linus Roach makes his approach and he's, he's wearing the bathrobe. He's walking toward her. He's playing the song. And I believe that the, the song is like his name is the name of the song, right? Yep. It is. Yeah. Um, and, and he's like kind of dancing into it and he's telling her, listen to the music, listen to the music. And, and then tells her that he wants her to you know, be part of his group and then comes in front of her and very dramatically disrobes. Yeah, just in front of her. Full on. Yep. Like, like, look upon my majesty. It's like, right? Papa Wayne, so, why are you doing this? Papa Wayne's dick just act. right there. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> and then the best possible rejection of that is, is what she does. She starts laughing at him. Yes. She laughs yes. at him. She laughs at the song. She's like, oh, you think this song is about you? It's not about you. And she's, and, and when you have dramatically disrobed in front of this woman you were trying to seduce, and her reaction is to start laughing at you. Yes. That, that is a dick punch on so many levels. So many. And her laugh isn't just a small laugh either. No. She's like, she starts kind of mania laughing. She's <laughs> like, laughing her ass like- off. Well, she's yes. also high because yeah. she got stung by yeah, wasp right. juice. No, <laughs> it's but, a wasp laugh. We've all done those too. Wasp laughs, you know. Yeah, but it is it. it what I love about it is it's such a, a a scene filled with dread. 
Because it, it's yes. at that red light you're talking about. It's the red light of the cult, right? Yeah. So you're in this black and red setting. All the cult looks very eerie looking at her. Yeah. Um, it's he super uncomfortable. Out. He's super eerie and weird. The whole setting is weird. She's just been stung by the wasp. She's laying on the floor. And you just there's so much dread in the scene. What is going yes. to happen to her? And when he disrobes the... I mean, we live in the world where we're all very aware of sexual assaults and all that stuff. And you're like, oh, my God, is he going to try to rape her? Right. Is, what, what's what's going to happen now, right? It's There's so much sort of sexual violence threatened there, regular yes. violence threatened there. All of it's threatened. And her reaction to just start laughing her ass off at him is such a denial of all of it. Denial yes. of the threat. Like, I'm not scared of you. I'm not scared of your little dick. I'm not scared of anything that's happening here. Fuck you guys. You don't get yep. to scare me. Well, it's like her getting her agency back too, right? Yeah. Like we're sitting there going like, oh my gosh, she is, is she going to get killed? Is she like, she's been drugged, you know, all this stuff. And as soon as she starts laughing, I'm like slow clapping for her. I'm yes. just like, no, this, she's not in trouble. Like whatever happens, she's still in control here. Like it's great. Well, She's in trouble, but she's, she has granted them none of her power. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I thought that was a, a brilliant choice, but also a brilliant performance. Like that moment is, you feel both sides of it. Because you also feel, I mean, it's been a good like four or five minutes of this buildup of him just doing kind of his peacocking in front of her. And yeah, the, yeah, and exactly. Just like the peacocking, the exactly. Yeah, and you're like, oh boy. And like, they're really milking the suspense of where this is going to go. And then she just, just turns it on its head. Diffuses like, oh, the whole thing. It's perfect. It's, it's really, perfect. really good. It's, it is maybe my, I, I think it is actually my favorite scene in the entire movie because it is such, it is such an unexpected moment and it is such a subversion of what that scene typically is in a lesser yes, movie. Completely agree with you. And it's, I mean, really, ultimately, this is the moment that sends her off because yeah. she gets killed right after this. So I was yes. like, this is, this is a really powerful way to send her out of this movie as well, well and, as opposed to just victimizing her. Yes. Yes. You're going to do what you're going to do, but I'm not your victim and I, and I'm not scared of you, which is, you know, I mean, any of us can be killed by anything, but, but the power of being able to say, I can't stop. You got a gun in your hand. I don't have a gun. You can shoot me. I can't stop you, but I'm not going to be scared of you. I'm not going to be threatened by you. And, and there, there, it's such a powerful moment. So unexpected in this kind of scene. Yeah. That really I, unexpected to this day. It's my, it's, it's the scene I most often remember when I, I think about I, would, when I was going back to rewatch it, that was the scene I remembered most myself. And it's even better than I remember too, because I like, Jeremiah Linus Roach. So he, yeah. the even the way that the camera is framing him is so brilliant. Where it's kind of like this low angle framing the archway, like the beams of yeah. the house behind him, like yeah, it's yeah. some kind of like cathedral, yeah, like Mother Mary star coming out from behind him. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. But then she's tripping because of the horn or the juice hornet sting, yeah. And then it, the illusion is that everybody else there is also kind of tripping, right? And when you watch it. What's crazy is the the it doesn't have hard cuts like most of the scene the edits are dissolving into each other. Which oh, really, really? I didn't notice yeah, that. So many of the cuts are dissolving into each other, and they feel like you're just on a trip. I mean, I've never done acid, but I feel like after I watched this movie, I have like right. it's, like <laughs> it's what it feels like. But then it has one of my favorite shots in the whole movie, which is the shot where it's square on Mandy, and it's just doing this long. I feel like it's a minute or two minute long dissolve into Linus Roach's face. And it's like a match cut where their faces are basically slowly morphing from one right. to the other. And I remember watching that just going like, this is just so cool. Like this is yeah. bonkers. And it was made with a lot of craftsmanship. <laughs> like it was just so well done. I would say it's interesting that you say that with craftsmanship, because I agree. And I think, I think one of the things I love about this movie is, it is so fucking weird, but everything in it feels deliberate. Yeah, it's a completely intentional. I thought yep. the same thing where I was like, like even going back to like the Cheddar Goblin thing, that yep. was the first moment watching it that stood out to me as unintentional. 
And then I find out, oh, it was exactly as intentional as everything else. As everything else. And it just uh, completely fixed my opinion on it. But it's it, it's insane how intentional this movie is for the yep. places that it goes. It's so those moments really you're smart. talking about, the dissolves and stuff, I didn't even notice them. But I'm sure my hind brain did. Like, you know, yeah, that. Because you feel that, it more, yeah. Because you feel it, that dreamlike quality of everything that's happening in that moment. You know, which, of course, yep. she's been stung by the, the juice wasp. So they give, you a, they give you a reason for it to be dreamlike. But even in the context of the movie, the, the, the dreamlike quality of everything that's happening there fits very well. But I also want to say, because she's so awesome in that last scene before she's killed, that made me even more pissed off and more on Nicolas Cage's side because I'm like, this woman's yeah. a fucking badass. She should get to live. She should get to win. It's so yeah. unfair that these idiots steal that from her yeah, because of their weird ass insecurity, whatever sh- bullshit Linus Roach is dealing with. Right. Steals this awesome person from the world. I was now I'm pissed. Like yeah. when, when Nicholas Cage is getting pissed, I'm pissed with him. I'm like, yeah, I'm on your team, man. Like, give me a reaper. Exactly. I'll go with you. We'll fuck these dudes up. Right. Cause it's yes. so, yes, it's so cruel that somebody that awesome. Winds up getting yes. killed. Yeah, I'm I like totally I, that moment lets you fall in love with her a little bit. No, I, I think that's exactly that's perfectly well put because mm. that moment, right? Like I, you're already you're already so invested in her, but you really do kind of start to hatch your own love for the character that you need because that pretty much permeates the rest of the movie. Like she haunts the rest of the movie, like yes. in yes. the sense that like you are like. Yeah, her her ghost is floating through the whole back half as Nicolas Cage is doing all that. But also what I love too is, it's another thing that I find so refreshing about the movie is I just love how harsh the lines between good and evil are in this. Like, what's crazy is the fact that they did that. I have no questions about who the bad guys are. And I can't wait for Nicolas Cage to do his thing. I'm not sitting there questioning his morality. <laughs> like, no. on any level. No, you're fully on board. <laughs> Fully, I'm you're like you're, you're like fuck those dudes up, and and he does some pretty dramatic things later. Yeah, that if we're not on board with, we're gonna turn on him. And now we got like the chemist. Yeah, right. The chemist was crazy. <laughs> oh, I mean, the chemist is. Uh, oh, hold on, let me look up his. Oh, Richard Brake. That's right. Because that was the other thought I had. I was like, he's the guy that killed Thomas Wayne in Batman Begins. I was right. like, now they're working together. What kind of weird universe is this? <laughs> um, but he was great. I was like the tiger. I was reading how the tiger that they had, he, um, I guess originally it was supposed to be a monkey or, uh, like, a. it wasn't supposed to be a tiger. And he found out on the day that they came to set and they were just like, Oh, by the way, we have a tiger. And he was like, uh, I mean, all right. <laughs> but that scene was so weird. But it it's also so weird. But it also felt like a a weird layer that helped to add definition to why all of these people were weird. Like it just felt like I got a further. It didn't confuse me more than it actually helped define things a little more. Even though it never said right. anything, you know, I was just like, okay, this is more weird. But I'm getting a picture of how weird this world is and these people are. And, and and this dude just sits around coming up with new ways to formulate uh, juice wasp yeah. venom into stronger drugs. And I, huh? I guess they were the only explanation they ever gave for the bikers. I think it was subtly in the movie, but I know the director was talking about it, how his own internal backstory was that the chemist had devised some form of drug that went too far. And when the bikers uh-huh. took it, it, actually caused them to descend into a supernatural plane and come back in this weird, the weird form that we see them in. But I was like, that's like, that's fast. It still doesn't spell it all out, but it does kind of paint a vague picture that is enough for me, but it's just interesting. Yeah. And, and he's the one who kind of is at peace with the end that he knows Mm -hmm. is coming. Yeah. It's almost like he's tripping so much. He's not really, holding on to his natural body too hard. <laughs> He's yeah. just kind of like, 
Yeah, well, okay. It's here funny we go. That, the, that you say the tiger was uh, something that was on the day because I, it felt very deliberate to me because of the tiger shirt that Nicolas Cage is wearing. Yeah, totally. Earlier. There's, so and he it's gets just there and a there's coincidence. A tiger. And, and he and the tiger are fine. Yeah, like totally he lets the tiger fine. go. Tigers goes, cool, man. See ya. <laughs> it does paint a picture too of the dedication that Red as a character has too. Because if I walked into a room with a tiger, I'd be like, well, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure my mission's over. Right. Just yeah. like, what am I going to do? Yeah, he's like, and, and, and I, I got this moment. So when he lets the tiger go and the tiger just leaves, um, I, I, you, you get this moment of like, it's that, it's that game respects game moment. Yeah. 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 Like totally. the tiger goes, Oh, I you're a predator too. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, Oh, so I, we don't I need to fuck you. with each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it like that, but that actually totally <laughs> works for me. I never Tiger's like, I'm going to go out in the woods and eat some shit. You you can do it and finish up whatever you need to do here. Yeah. By the way, <laughs> love your shirt. <laughs> yeah, love the shirt. <laughs> That's really yeah. funny. I love that. And then and then we get to the most over the top moment I think of the movie, where now we must face the final defender yep. of the boss, and that will turn into a chainsaw fight. Yes, <laughs> which is just like, can you imagine on paper <laughs> going um. <laughs> I'm thinking a lightsaber battle, but with chainsaws instead of lightsabers. <laughs> but it's well, and it's everything. I mean, I, that's what everyone was talking about most with this movie when I was hearing all about it prior to seeing it was just Nicolas Cage being his Nicolas Cageist and the chainsaw yeah. fight. And of course, it's the poster too, like him just with the chainsaw. But it's a it's incredible. <laughs> I don't know how it's, they did it. It's it's such a weird fight too because i mean they do okay you know this is good world building they establish that nicholas cage is an expert with a chainsaw in the very first scene of the movie right right so, so we get it you know so so it's not unexpected it's not it's he didn't suddenly develop chainsaw powers he knows his way around you know? a chainsaw he's an expert he's an expert with a chainsaw so when he is confronted with i must defend myself with a chainsaw he knows what he's doing right but there's this comic beat where he's got the chainsaw and the other guy pulls out I don't know what that chainsaw is designed to cut down, but it's like 37 feet long. Yeah, it is. It's like the equivalent. <laughs> what is that chainsaw for? <laughs> it's like Joker at the end of the original Batman, right? Just pulling the gun out. <laughs> just right, pull like, the gun out of his pants and it just keeps coming like, out. Have yeah. you been, was that there all day? <laughs> like, how have you been walking? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, that's what's funny is I feel like out of context, it feels so cartoony, but the movie is just descended into such a weird wacky place i you just kind of go with it you're just like yeah of course he yeah it's like i guess that's what happens this is what you know? this guy does <laughs> he's got a big ass chainsaw yeah. and nicholas cage has a, a modest chainsaw but it's not the size of your chainsaw it's how you use it that's right that's so, right <laughs> so you know nicholas cage has has better chainsaw skills right it's the skill that matters that's it's the what's skill that matters. Important. It's not the it's not the length of your chainsaw that matters. There's elements of it that seem jokey, like you know he's got the mm. regular chainsaw, and the other guy's got the like ten foot long chainsaw, right? But it doesn't play jokey because no, exactly. Like you actually feel like people are going to get fucked up with these chainsaws, and in fact, big chainsaw dude does get fucked up with the chainsaw very badly. Yes, quite graphically. Um, <laughs> If the movie, if you didn't think the movie was uh, too gory yet, this is the scene that will uh, push you over the edge. Yeah. One thing that uh, movies have done in the past when chainsaws were involved is they treat chainsaws like they're swords, like they mm -hmm, can cut mm -hmm. you. Chainsaws don't right. cut. Chainsaws rip and tear. That's right. And so when that guy falls on that chainsaw, it doesn't cut him. It just starts ripping him to pieces, exactly. which is what chainsaws do. Yep. Um, so it was, it was a very well done and practical again we you know we talked last time i'm in furious about practical effects yeah um so and i know you've done stuff. movies with a lot of practical stuff this is a this was a pretty dramatic practical effect where yes. that chainsaw's ripping pieces of that guy off big time yeah. so he defeats chainsaw guy through the power of chainsaw because <laughs> he, power he chainsaw. has higher chainsaw skills than other chainsaw <laughs> see other dude didn't have the skills he tried to make up for it with the size yeah, of he was chainsaw. compensating a little bit nicholas cage skill wins out yes 100 <laughs> percent well, and, and after Chainsaw Guy, then he goes, the old woman tries to seduce him. But we don't see the end of that. We just see he goes in there. She tries to seduce him. 
get get him that way sort of as yep. the final test and then we go into what looks like the cathedral or right the, like the main i, I don't even know what you would describe that room as i mean where linus roach is in this weird temple that I, they're in it almost felt like a uh those rooms that you always see like in all the old Victorian stories where like there it's like everyone's sitting in a circle, like overlooking like the amphitheater classrooms or like yeah. the amphitheater, like, yeah, yeah. Like it felt like, like a Masonic temple version of like that. Yeah. You know? it's like it's creepy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that, yeah, that Masonic temple kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Goes in there. Now we get the confrontation finally between Nicholas Cage and Linus Roach in this temple and Nicholas Cage Let's us know how the end of the uh, seduction sequence goes. Yes. When he throws the old lady's severed head into the middle of the room. That's like the... Which, by the way, is the moment if we weren't so thoroughly on his side that the movie could lose it. Yeah. Because it's implying that after this woman tried to seduce him, he just chopped her head off. Right. right? Exactly. If we had any, any debate about anything as far as whose side to be on. Yeah. It would have really messed things up, but I actually messed things up. But what I like is it's actually really brilliant to me that they didn't resolve that scene with her until this right. moment, because until this moment, because that is a scene when she's doing that, that I feel like it r- seems like that always feel like they're turning the mirror on the audience a little bit, you know, cause right. now it's like, I'm actually posing the question to you. You don't have a chainsaw to fight this guy. You don't have this, but this is just a right. question I'm asking Nicolas Cage and you, right? So now you're kind of like, I don't, what is the, this is what? And then the fact that they're kind of held in this brief moment of suspense, what did he end up doing? And then the answer is the right. head. It's like, love this guy. This is so awesome. And, and you're so thoroughly on his side at this point. Yep. And, 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 and the cult is so repulsive. Oh my gosh. Yeah. When her head rolls into the room, at least I was like, fuck that bitch. Yeah. Yeah. No, good. I'm glad he chopped her head off. She was horrible. The audience cheers. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Which you shouldn't be cheering at an old lady getting her head chopped off. (laughs) You shouldn't. (laughs) But but man, you sure do. The movie does such a good job at that point. You're like, yeah, no, screw her. This is how much we hate these guys. Yeah. That's how much we hate them. And. The Linus Roach character is so bad at it. Nicholas Cage has had to do so much to get to this. Yes. He had to fight through horrible injuries. He had to fight through the four bikers of the apocalypse. He had to fight through chainsaw dude yeah. and, and, and defeat the chemist and defeat the old lady and, and all of the horrible stuff he's had to go through. And now here is the object of his revenge. Right. The guy who made the decision to burn the love of his life alive. Yeah, and he should burn be the alive. biggest boss. But He should be the biggest boss, and he's so pathetic. Yep, exactly. He's so pathetic. He starts screaming and crying when he sees the severed head. He gets down on his knees. He's begging for his life. He offers to blow yeah, Nicholas Cage if he'll like, let him live. <laughs> what? But going back to what I was yeah. saying, though, that's what it felt like as far as scrolling through the Rolodex of tactics, yep. right? Yeah. I was like, well, here he is. Like he's, he's, this is a complete manipulation. You know, it's like, I can't yeah. fight you. I'll so. be so pathetic. You can't kill me. Exactly. Look how pathetic I am. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and had Nicholas Cage bought it and let this guy run off a history probably would have repeated itself somewhere down oh, the road. Yeah. With he would have just went and started his cult somewhere else. Yeah. It's not like yeah. he'd run away going like, I'm never going to like, it's all an act. It's all, a, it's all a self-centered lie yep. you know and yeah. i was like yep. see look that literally he is he is running through just the gamut of all the different ways you have to confront darkness <laughs> yeah i love uh, it so nicholas cage uh spoiler alert makes the decision not to fall for it <laughs> yeah by the way <laughs> <laughs> how crazy Choose, would it be if chooses he did? not to fall for it <laughs> he's like you know what <laughs> i will take you up on that <laughs> yeah you know what you know what linus you're okay <laughs> <laughs> you look like you should. I'm, I'm going to leave you here to raise Bruce Wayne in the future. I feel really bad for you right now, so I'm just gonna. Even though I murdered like ten people to get here, I you, feel kind of bad. You, for I'm going to let go. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, he elects not to go that path, and Linus Roach gets a well-deserved um, end to his story. Yes, an exit from the film. Yeah, and then we and then we end with. So I feel like, so the movie has been a journey 
from the real world to this nightmare world. And we've been slowly moving further and further into the nightmare world as the movie has gone on. Yeah. And that's shown up both in the things that are happening, but also in the visuals. You, you point out uh, some of the visual tricks that are being used here yeah. to give this that sort of dreamlike sense. Stumps, you noticed some stuff I didn't even notice. That's great. I'm really glad you were here for this. Um, so that, that transition from when he starts out, he's just a guy who works a job. He's cutting down trees. Yeah. And there's other guys cutting down trees. This, ha- is, this is taking place in a world in which people have jobs. Right. Right? They're which is a very people. normal thing, right? And she has a job. She works in a little store, and she reads sci-fi books, and they yeah. hang out together and watch cartoons. And They're so happy and, with a like, simple life. They're happy with their simple life. And so we start out in such a normal place. And then weirder and weirder shit happens and the filming gets weirder and weirder. And the, you know, things like you pointed out like the color and the grain and the darkness and all of those tricks are pulling us. And then we get to the moment he has, he's confronted Linus Roach in the cathedral of the elder God. Everything in there is black or red. Yes. Everything. everything. It is just black and red. He defeats him. He leaves and he drives away and he drives into a heavy metal painting. Yeah. Like the, the, the scene behind him, the sky behind him, we are fully in the other realm now. Yeah. It was, we are not in reality <laughs> anymore at all. No, I don't know where he, where he wound up, but it is not the world I live in. I know. I, I don't think, I don't think he goes back to his chainsaw job. I don't, I don't think I, they have chainsaw jobs in this reality. <laughs> yeah. No, like, <laughs> I don't know what happens there, but it is not the normal world. He, I don't think you get a job at a shop in that world. No, he goes and he starts a shop. It's called Xenoax and he, it's called Xenoax and he just gonna, makes Xenoax. He's going to be a blacksmith. I, you know what? I'd watch that movie. <laughs> I 100% would watch that. The sequel to Mandy is just called Xenoax, yeah. and it's just Nicolas Cage forging Xenoaxes and selling them to weirdos in this like post-apocalyptic Bill Duke are cosmic still, like, horror talking. universe. Like, hey, man, I can't hang out tonight. I got like an order of like six Xenoaxes I got to finish up, so maybe yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. And, and every, every night after working at the forge, he goes, he and Bill Duke just drink beer. Yeah, make some Cheddar <laughs> Goblin mac and cheese. and It's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god man I, I, all right we should get funny we'll make this movie okay let's do it let's do it i'm down <laughs> it's going to be fantastic i know nicholas cage will do it like no doubt no doubt no doubt he's going to do that so do you have any final thoughts i think uh the experience of watching this movie it's just a it it is like an out-of-body experience watching it like it is such a trip like by the time the movie's done and the lights come up it feels like you just woke up from either a dream or a nightmare, depending on how you want to look at it, but it's so wild. But one of the things I love about this movie is I heard Nicholas Cage say that he really wanted to play red. Cause he liked the opportunity of playing Jason. Like he basically was like the, the villain of this right. movie actually becomes red, except you're on his side, but he is right. The enemy to these people. And I was like, what a cool subversion. I just love, I love the style of it. I love how hard it swings for the fences, even in its craziest yes. moments. It does a very intelligent job of earning its craziness. Yeah, and I agree. Nicolas Cage is so his performance is so great. Just the directing to the acting to the writing. It's a, uh, it's one to still be talking about in 2024 and onward. It, it's it's funny that you mentioned the writing because I think there are like 12 lines of dialogue in the entire Hardly movie. any like dialogue. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's just the it story is, is mapped out so this, well. Yeah. It's just, it's, I, w- I would say that more than most movies, this is absolutely director's movie. Yeah. 100%. Right? Yes. This is, this is this director's vision. He's telling a story with his camera that isn't on a page somewhere. Yeah. It's just, he's telling the story using, visuals and performance and all that stuff. Exactly. Um, I came out of this with enormous respect for this director. Same. You know, he did, and, and he, he did a great episode of like, uh, if you did, did you ever watch the cabinet of curiosities? Yes. It's, he yes. directed, he directed an episode on there that was so yes. good. I, by the way, I, I, I liked that, that little oh, anthology show. I, I thought it was, cool. I, I I thought it was exceptional. I, I was like, yeah. 
It's one of my favorites in a while. Yeah, I, I wish they would yeah, do another season. Yeah, so I came out of, of this it. with a lot of respect for him. I would, yeah. I would like to see more stuff from him. Same. I mean, this is one of those things that's so weird and so clearly a passion project. Sometimes when people make an amazing passion project, they never quite rise to that level again, because this was the movie that they've spent twenty years thinking about. Right. They finally yeah. got to make it. Um, but sometimes they do. Sometimes people do. You know. Right. It would, are able to pull it off over and over. I'd love to see more stuff. Just from to him. see him do more and. It, I, I really did appreciate learning how much. Uh... Well, so, so we, we probably got to get going. So I'm supposed to remind everybody to uh, like comment about how awful Wes is and how much better this is when he's not <laughs> oh, here. Geez. Please, no. please make sure to do those comments. How much more insightful, how he says the names correctly, <clears throat> how he pronounces words cor- correctly. Um, please make sure to comment. I think about Brett that. has to steal Wes's favorite thing to do what is that tell ty to say goodbye say goodbye ty fuck off joseph (laughs) (laughs) perfect